is a Joel Buster. Smoking cigarettes, drinking vodka, and eating from the last pile of shit. I'm getting kind of drunk. It's called These Times. Three fifty-two a.m. here. And nothing to do. Pour it on. And remember, departed loves like heads lolling in the weeds. Spit blood into the toilet as my head remains silent, and my guts turn on a mystery to themselves. I can feel the sun ready to poke around the corner of the world. And it is sad, because this is when life awakens and spills forth. And you can feel the bones groaning under all the weight of this uselessness. Off the jobs, or feeding children, or mowing lawns, or driving down clogged freeways, or strapped in the machinery that will not stop. And for me, all that is left with this little piece of night, these walls that lean in and hold me, and this cigarette, and this bottle which holds away the dawn like love, like desire, like the weakness of each footstep. And I think the only way to keep these walls is to leave these walls. And the clock flashes in the dark like some insane traitor bomb in hand tongue held in clenched teeth, face painted dead gray, and eyes overflowing hate, like pocket change, like the punch clock, like standing in line, like the knives surrounding us. It's so much easier, so much more modern than love. Different eyes. Broken teeth smile, eyes gouged out, stuffed with wax and plastic. Pages from long dead books clenched in white fingers, bent over in this chair, almost out of this chair. I gave up. I give up. I can feel something tightening and loosening inside, something giving way, stretching past and tattered some gouge that will not come back together. I made a mistake. It's nothing to be shamed by, nothing that will kill me, although what it may make me do might. It's just that those eyes might become different eyes now. I did not stand for them to change. Rage of a lost Rage of our lost penny. Well, it's said and done. I watched that old car pull away, probably for the last time. I didn't expect anything more than I got, so in a way, it was a very small loss. Not even a loss. I never had anything. More a failure. Which makes it all the more too typical. Ladies, man. I come down the stairs and she's huddled on the kitchen floor, weeping against a colossal pile of empty beer bottles. Of course, I think, I've done something wrong. I take her in my arms. It's the first time we've touched. Her tears soak my shirt. She's ten years younger than I, a Catholic, a virgin, confused about nearly everything. I've known her for about six hours, and now she's falling apart on my dirty kitchen floor. I have this way with the ladies. I've given up. Note on my door. Knocks my head in disbelief. I can barely conjure her face, but her eyes are as clear as kerosene pumping through my veins. 
I don't know what it is, but she's had me from the moment I first met her. The door opened and I was gone. It was almost comical. But really, I don't know how to describe the feelings I get from her. Like this easy steadiness radiating off. Some call it style. It's so rare I call it magic. You should see those eyes. You couldn't lie to them. I think they've seen more than she has. Note in the door, and I am a wreck stumbling along in the rubble of my room, trying to find the words for her, some sort of reply. I can't find them. Love life. Get a call from my ex-girlfriend. She's in the kitchen drinking wine. She was thinking of me. It's strange. We endured one of the most horrible breakups I've ever encountered, and now, over a year later, we're better friends than we were lovers. It's agonizing, the cycles we go through. To get to the point we started, yet here we are, two old lovers, speaking through wire, as respectful and painfully polite as two young schoolgirls. I ask her how things are with her new lover. Still going well, she tells me. He's a good boy. I'm happy for her. After me, she deserves a respite at least, if not lifelong happiness. But of course, none of us are going to get that. It's just not there. We talk a bit more. She's in the kitchen drinking wine and she's thinking of me. She asks me about my love life. I just gave a desperate little sardonic laugh. After her, I guess I deserve a respite too. And this is it. Streak. You wonder where it all comes from. One failure piled on top of another. One impossibility in front of another. The day I decided to give up, they started arriving. Notes on the door, voices from outside my window, footsteps creaking up the stairs, the phone kept ringing, it was insane, they began arriving two or three at a time, I started losing them one by one that way, I didn't care, it was worth it to sit there half drunk and bask in their gentle mutual animosity, they thought I had something, but it was a con, a scam, I was just around, that's all. And all this after months, years of nothing. They hit you with it all at once or not at all. And of course, it will be over soon. It's almost gone now. It's been quiet and dark. The phone hasn't rung all night. I keep picking it up to hear the dial tone to make sure it's still working. It's about the only thing around here that still is. Kind of makes me think I should have tried for one of them. One beyond us. We we're going to smoke. A, we we're going to smoke a joint in the graveyard, but there were no means. So I told her I'd be back in five minutes, and I went to buy some papers. When I got back, there was a car pulled up next to her, and this guy was asking when he could meet her again. He had a tan, sunglasses pushed back on his head, perfect teeth. He looked like he had rolled off an assembly line. She was smiling at him, leaning into the car, and the smile was cracking headstones, bringing the sun to its knees, making death meaningless, everything meaningless. Who was that guy, she asked after he drove away. I was just going to ask you the same thing, I answered. Shit, I don't know, he pulled over and I thought he said my name, but now I'm not so sure. Yeah, well... He wants me to go out to dinner with him tonight. I don't even know this guy. Yeah, some guys are like that, always on the attack. Well, I don't know, maybe he's a really cool guy. Maybe. You still want to smoke that joint? 
Sure, she said, and we walked deeper into the graveyard, where it got shady and still. I thought of the guy in his nice new car, with his shades on and his crisp white tucked in shirt. I felt sorry for him. He wasn't going to get it either. Falling apart slowly. The song was very short, and I must admit, very sweet. But armies of ants wage war over less than nothing all the time. There is no sense to any of it. We struggle against emptiness. We fall on platitudes and plate glass, and shop store remedies. We take it down with equal parts sugar and shit, and when it comes up, we apologize. We know that crackling in the corners all too well. That scuttling beneath the floorboards of our hearts. We fall down. We spread our guts over fallow fields. We fail because we were never expected to do anything other. There's so much there and so much we want. But we don't know where to go, how to get it, how to hold on to it. We open our hands. And it falls away. The way it will go. There's the first night, then the next day. It is like a self sufficient delusion. We fuck, we talk, we eat, we go to the movies. We don't fuck. She drops me off. Neither of us mention the phone or plans or move in any direction at all. I walk into the house, open a window, turn on the lights, turn them off. Walk into the bathroom, stare into the mirror. My eyes open in horror, and it all makes sense. A legitimate concern. She phones late Saturday night. How are you, she asks. I called last night, but you didn't answer. I almost came by. I stayed at a friend's house, I tell her. Did you go and get drunk at Dave's house again? No, a new friend. I can't believe you, she cries. Another girl? On the couch, I tell her. I can't believe you, she says again. Just last week you were sniveling over the last one. What are you doing? Have you heard from her? No. Why don't you call her? Try to resolve it. It's resolved, I say. She's gone. So you just trot on to the next one like everyone you're always bitching about. Look, I told her I slept on the couch, goddammit. I hang up the phone. These people... I'm not on the cross. It's like something isn't right with me. Like the perception is smeared. They think I'm selling out. Maybe they think I'll become less entertaining. Less the clown and the recontour. It affects the world. They grow concerned. Where's the concern when I'm flicking the razor blade in and out from its little plastic handle at 3.32 a.m. Too drunk to do anything or watch it glint in the lamplight. In and out. In and out, it makes a sound like death whispering through a window pane. And yeah, I lied. I didn't get the couch. She's a very nice girl. But when the morning sun crept through the cracks in that shade and I awoke, I was sad to realize that it wasn't the last one, or even the one before that. And I started thinking about getting drunk again and flicking that cheap little razor in and out. In and out. So don't worry about it. Arena. The bull's front legs break as he hits the dust. And the first blade goes in. Then the second. And he charges around, but he's weak now. You can see his blood splashing into the hungry dirt. There's no way he's going to make it. There's never any chance. 
The sun beats down on everything. They drag the body around the arena. We're supposed to feel some sort of victory in the air, but there's no bravery involved, no great show of valor. The odds are stacked and the loser lost. Again. The sun beats down. The bullet's dead. And as far as I can tell, the world around me is falling down drunk and completely insane. The Devil's Night. Standing in the kitchen, pouring down vodka, leaning against the counter. It's too late to be awake. Why am I still awake? My stomach rises into my throat. I lurch to the sink, let it go. There's a full moon tonight, but they tell us this means something. That it works in the tide. Well, I can feel the tide working on me right now. These words pour out of their own accord. I snarl at the balcony, howl at dried leaves, drive stakes through the hearts of cold virgins. Headlights on the street pour through my eyes. My heart swells like something possessed. I can sense you at every street corner. I see you crossing your legs high on every bar stool, climbing into every car that pulls over. I bang on the walls of my tiny room, spill coins out of my pockets, kiss the cheek of the executioner. Standing in the kitchen and that moon keeps rising into that sky, I think of stone sculptures disintegrating, or you on a hospital bed, or four fingers on a table separate from my hand. A train's running into each other, Planes falling out of the sky. The fact that with so little there, we managed to waste it all. We want to think we've got it, but we never do. We want to think it's enough, but it never is. We strain at it. We boil away and evaporate. We stumble over our own good intentions. There's never any way we we're going to make it. The windows crack in sympathy, and my blue walls turn a deeper blue. The whole room is sad, and I tell myself, after this cigarette, I will go to bed. After this last cigarette. Always goodbye to Emily. It gets dark around here as the clouds move in. And light rain makes the leaves dance. It's good to be inside, having all the pieces attached and a full fifth of vodka and cigarettes. Bums know this. Animals don't need this, but I am neither, and half my head swells in pain. An unease slithers through me like something other in my veins. My bones shake with the memory of the darkest eyes that are gone now, with the soul radiating through them and the body that was holding it all together. It was there. I saw it there in front of me. And now I never had anything. I feel like I lost it. And if I ever see you again, maybe I'll tell you this. And maybe you'll know what I mean. Alone. It's hard enough to be alone. It doesn't have to be a war every day. There is peace. You just have to find it. It is not a natural condition. Peace is expensive. Very few of the poor know what peace is. There is always something or someone shattering the calm, breaking things apart. There are too many of us. And the rich are so worried about owning their peace that they can scarcely enjoy it. They put fences around it and little signs that say, I cannot share. 
They look very much like they should be wearing bonnets and sucking at lollipops. It's hard to find peace. It's hard to be alone for any of us. My good friend, Mr. Sarah. I should have had more faith, especially in her. But it's hard to trust anyone, especially when you bear yourself open, knowing full well there's no way it will work. You prepare, you prepare for the worst, cross your heart, and go ahead and spill it anyway. And she took it well. But as I watched her taillights fade, I really thought that I would never see her again. Then a week later she came by. Then the next night, then the night after that. It was okay. The easiness was back. Even better than that, it seemed easier. And it rests there, untouched. We've never spoken of it again, which is just as well. Nothing more needs to be said. There's nothing in this world I would not do for that woman. She knows it now, and we can just leave it there. Like that. Uh, Sarah. Coffee cups collide and fall off shelves. Snakes rise up and learn to walk. The sounds of the night turn on and out like the earth exhaling. There's no way any of this is going to work. They fly by and collide into you like wreck wreckage spinning around in a vacuum. A crack here, a fissure there, all of us lined up like targets. None of us have any choice. Something finally is going to hit dead on. It's a law of averages. Just hope you can live with it. Eighty-six. We were young, desperate, not at all normal. Maybe during the Depression we would have made sense. But we were told this was merely a recession, and there was this plastic sheen over almost everything now. Even the poor punch-drunk cows that worked within the kitchen, the warehouse, the torture rack, even they couldn't admit to futility, to defeat. The days had passed when you could sit on a dusty porch with a rolled cigarette and a half-dead dog at your feet and just sigh as the winds blew your life away. All these fuckers had plans, scams, cons. The 80s were supposed to be a time of endless opportunity. Everybody had an angle on the dollar sign, but we didn't buy it. We were young. We wanted something more, some connection to something real. All we had was condos, Camaros, cruising, rubbers, AIDS, college, nuclear power, nuclear bombs, space shuttles, shopping malls, crack, cash machines, 9 millimeters, a government 100 years in debt. We knew there was no chance their way. We were going to have to do it ourselves, grab back every single shred we could get from them. We helped each other. We drank. We did every drug we could find. We made music that it could have killed entire city blocks if we'd ever gotten out. We ignored women. We ignored our parents. We ignored our bosses. We went insane and locked rooms, painted black. We did it together. We did it alone. During this time, I began writing. I don't know why I started, and to be honest, I didn't really know what I was doing. It was like another discovery of that time, jazz. I just didn't know what it was. I didn't know what to call it. When you write one line after another, what do you call it? Oh yes, poetry. I didn't know it at the time, but I was drunk and on a variety of drugs and writing these poems that moved across the page like a burnished glow like a burning robin lighting up a trash heap. 
as the red angels flew up like arcing energy, like the whisper of pearl of your shoes and the love of my heart, the electricity of love that will never touch me. I didn't know what I was doing, but I was doing it, and I think at the time it made sense anyway. We were young, we were desperate, we didn't know what to do about any of it. The nights out there, drinking beer, whiskey, wine, trying to find a place that was safe, behind the church, by the canals, the river, the fields behind the junior high, the railroad tracks, the bridge, the basketball courts. Maybe it was because we lived in such a bland and demeaning semi-urban squalor, or maybe all the acid we were taking, but I remember this almost spiritual admiration for trees and nature of any kind. We sought it out. Believe me, in this place, the best you could do was the medium between two highways. Or the bush in your backyard. There wasn't any in our beds. We were doomed. There were mornings, I remember, walking to work through miles of tenement blocks, stinking of various cooking foods, and bags of rotten garbage on the street, and tiny children tottering into traffic and screaming, and the voices, the voices were enough to send you crawling into the nearest sewer break, but I would make it through my combat, and I got through the railroad bridge, to the workplace there, like a concrete block in the middle of hell. And I always went in and out through the back loading bay doors. I only went through the front door once for my interview. I remember they had a nice lobby. Looking back now, I can't believe I made it for two years in that place. I must have seen a hundred men go through there. It was like a river of human detritus. And I was caught in the current. I didn't think I would ever escape. Spring, summer, fall, winter in that place. It didn't seem possible. It didn't seem real. Doing the same meaningless task every single day, all day. You could see the chain of nothing. You could visualize office buildings crammed full with corpses, stinking like the sharp, curdled air of a milk cooler we all dreaded. Went out back for a cigarette. There was the bridge, the chain link fence, the railroad tracks, the highway, the overpass. It truly seemed like hell. And we all had similar jobs. We were young. We were half insane. We didn't know what else to do. It was rent to pay, beer to buy, bags of pot and else. We barely ate. We barely did anything, but it was the 80s. The money was supposed to be out there if we wanted it. I guess we didn't want it. Myself, I couldn't get solvent. I wanted to pick up and move somewhere, anywhere, but there didn't seem to be anywhere to go, or any money to get there on. We talked of it, picking up and getting the fuck out, and it would come up again and again and again as we sat wherever we could find, pulling at bottles, bristling, and angry, and crazy, and already doomed, although we didn't know it. And while the cars made their endless loop, smashing into each, o each other at every corner, and time didn't seem so much to have stopped, but to have never begun. home with one eye closed. Yeah, here's one for you. An apocalypse like burnt knees and white skin of innocence. Deep flush of dark red. Almost black. I'm a skeleton memory scratching at the tip of the blending scream house sky. The sky. Towering, gray, and immune antiseptic nurse to the wounds of various continuing in injuries. Inflicted and cared for like delicate blemished babies. Soft brown roots sinking into the deep sea of ground. Like the face of a broken clock buried by the years and the war. 
each year a knot in the rope long enough to wrap around your neck a thousand times a thousand times and still tie you up to the post. That light is a million years old. It's easy to forget life, the fact of living, as the clock ticks away to crumbled sheets, to a fuse lit just to burn. It's easy to forget that it will end, that there is a limit to purposeful waste. Just as there is a limit to expended effort and the cause of some imagined success. This is balanced by the sun outside the window, falling with no effort, no effect, by the deadness in this house, laying half dead in the bed or cracking beers in some corner of the kitchen. One more to the dust, dancing in shafts of dying sunlight. This too will end. I think of the end before I can even conceive of a change. Finality is a good reason to put your feet up with the beer. I mean, who cares if the dishes pile? But then, drudgery brings reflection. You get so you buy any old bullshit. Because even a bad reason is better than none. Maybe it is me. Maybe there's something wrong. Maybe I need help. But then, of course, I'm not the one pulling on the end of the dirty tablecloth. You're not the one crying. You're not the one spilling oil on the coast, breaking bottles over pregnant heads, sending $64 million missiles of nothingness into the void. You're not the one that bombed the hospital that fucked all the girls at the disco, that killed the young couple and their child, that rigged the fight so the loser could lose twice. You're not the one that decided it had to be like this. Still, it wears on. Attrition is rule. Or maybe it is me.